In 2006, police were called to the scene of something awful that just occurred next to the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. What they were going to figure out next was even more shocking than what they just discovered. This is the disturbing case of Addie Hall. Hello friend and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel and on here I specialize in true crime and making the best gluten-free waffles. Today we're looking at the case of Addie Hall and her boyfriend of the time, Zach Bowen. You're going to learn how awful of a person he was and what transpired through the course of their relationship. Our story takes us to New Orleans, Louisiana. As of 2020, it has a population of about 384,000 people. Nicknamed the Big Easy, it's known for its music scene, the food, and party partying all night long. If you're visiting in town, you're most likely there to see the Mardi Gras. But that's not why we're there today. Addie Hall was considered to be a free-spirited and feisty-tempered artist who lived in the New Orleans in her 20s. She had a rough upbringing and was sexually abused as a child. Growing up in North Carolina, she started to suffer from bipolar disorder, and she would irregularly take the medication her doctors prescribed to her. This would cause her to randomly be angry and uncontrollably lash out at people. She moved to the French Quarter, which is often called the crown jewel of New Orleans, and it's one of its most historic neighborhoods. Addie was a poet, an artist, and a dancer, and to make money, she worked as a bartender at a place called the Spotted Cat Music Club. This is where she would meet Zach Bowen, her future boyfriend. Zach grew up in California and was considered to be a laid back and relaxed type of person. He got married while he was still in high school to a woman named Lena. Together, they had two children, and in order for Zach to help take care of everything, he would join the army because of the benefits it would provide. Zach purposefully started to fail his health and fitness tests so he could go back home and care for his wife, who was recently diagnosed with hepatitis C and became very ill. But while he was in the army, Lena took their kids and decided to leave him. This left Zach feeling terrible, and soon he would decide to leave the army. And despite him earning a NATO medal and the presidential unit citation for his service and a recommendation from his commanding officer that he should receive an honorable discharge, he was instead released with only a general discharge. This means he would qualify for VA benefits, but he couldn't get GI Bill education benefits. VA benefits are typical benefits like housing and things like that, while GI Bill education benefits are, well, for education. They help for college and training programs, and because Zach couldn't get this, this left him very irritated. He soon found himself in the French Quarter in the New Orleans, and he was very lonely and suffering from PTSD. One of the worst things that he saw while he was in Iraq was when a young girl he befriended was killed along with her entire family due to their shop being bombed. In 2005, Addie and Zach would meet while bartending and she often gave him a hard time and acted mean towards him. This was Addie's way of flirting. In August of that year, a very deadly Category 5 Hurricane Katrina would soon turn New Orleans upside down. The hurricane would flood everything and destroy so much that they decided to stay at Addie's apartment and it was there they became inseparable. Sadly, the love wasn't as real as it should have been, but they ended up refusing to evacuate their neighborhood and instead decided to live without electricity and feed stray cats and mix cocktails for random people. They were photographed in several magazines and newspapers for doing this and were even interviewed. Soon things would start to become normal again and the city would start operating as it did before, but Addie and Zach were not ready to go back to reality. They started to have bills pile up and their jobs came back and everything just became a disaster. Zach was still in love with his ex-wife and he missed his children dearly and Addie definitely started to pick up on it. Though Zach didn't want to pay child support and he really didn't want to deal with his ex-wife, Addie just wanted him all to herself. But sadly, the couple's honeymoon phase was over and they started to constantly argue. They were drinking all the time and they started regularly doing cocaine and just started to break apart. In late 2006, while walking down Rampart Street, they came across a for rent sign for an apartment that was above a place called Voodoo Spiritual Temple, which is ran by priest Oswan Shamani and priestess Miriam Shamani. Addie and Zach looked at this as a way to possibly rekindle their relationship and hopefully make things work. Though I think it was Addie who mostly wanted things to work. They made an offer on the apartment and they moved in right away. But within literally a few days, Addie caught Zach cheating on her and then she very angrily went to their landlord, Leo Watermeyer, and said she was kicking him out. She asked for him to take Zach's name off the lease and that she was done with him. Leo actually wrote Addie a handwritten contract asking if she thinks that they could sort it all out, hoping that they would get back together. Which is really weird. 
Why did he do that? It was none of his business. But this was the last time anyone had seen Addy Hall alive. Zach ended up seeing Leo shortly after, and Leo told him what Addy had said, and Zach became enraged and out of control. On October 17th, at around 8.30 p.m., the New Orleans police received a very disturbing call about a man who had jumped from the top of the Omni Royal Orleans Hotel. When police got there, they discovered a man that they couldn't identify, and so they started checking his body for any form of ID. In Zach's back pocket, it, they found a handwritten note that goes as follows. This is not accidental. I had to take my own life to pay for the one I took. If you send a patrol to A26 North Rampart, you will find the dismembered corpse of my girlfriend Addie in the oven, on the stove, and in the fridge, along with full documentation on the both of us and a full signed confession from myself, Zach Bowen. Police then rushed to the small apartment above the voodoo spiritual temple, and what they discovered inside would haunt them all forever. It was a warm October day, and when they went inside the apartment, it was very cold, with the air conditioning set to about 60. The walls were spray painted with sentences like, I'm a total failure, or look in the oven, or call Lena Bowen and tell her I love her, and I'm sorry I couldn't finish. And lastly, on the oven that said, don't look. Which is weird, because he said on the wall to look in the oven. Inside the oven was the legs and the arms of Addie Hall, and Zach put seasoning on them to cook them. The police found her head inside of a pot on the front of the stove, and her feet and hands were inside of another pot on the back burner of the stove. Zach put her torso in a black trash bag in the refrigerator, and decided he was going to deal with that later. What happened was at around 1 a.m. on Thursday, October 5th. It's assumed that Zach and Addie got into an argument and then Zach strangled Addie to death. He would then commit necrophilia and get up the next day to go to work. While he was working, his co-workers said they remembered him acting out of character and wearing sunglasses and a hat and being very quiet. Over the course of the next several days, Zach started cutting up Addie's body and he even gave her a haircut as well. Addie's friends and their co-workers started to ask Zach where she was and he told them that she left him and went back to North Carolina. Some of them were pretty surprised and some of them weren't because Addie tended to be pretty sporadic and do things in the heat of the moment. At the crime scene, police found Addie's journal with the last entry from Zach and here's what it said. Today is Monday, October 16th, 2 a.m. I killed her at 1 a.m. Thursday 5th of October. I very calmly strangled her. It was very quick. Halfway through the task, I stopped and thought about what I was doing. The decision to halt the first idea and move to plan B, the crime scene you are now in, came after a while. I scared myself not by the action of calmly strangling the woman I've loved for one and a half years and then desecrating her body, but by my entire lack of remorse. I've known for forever how horrible of a person I am, ask anyone, and decided to quit my jobs and spend the $1,500 cash I had being happy until I killed myself. So that's what I did. Good food, good drugs, good strippers, good friends, and any loose ends I may have had. I didn't contact any of my family, so that'll explain the shock, and had a fantastic time living out my days. It's just about time now. Friends and family of both Addie and Zach were very shocked about this and just couldn't believe it. And though Zach did everything to cook her, there was no signs of cannibalism and no traces of her inside of him. Which doesn't make the situation any better, but I just thought I would throw that out there. This is a terrible case of someone who desperately wanted to be in a relationship with a piece of shit. I hope that Addie is resting peacefully and that Zach is damned in eternal hell. But anyways, thank you for watching the first episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I'll be posting content here weekly and I would love to post more, so give me a reason to. Take care, friend.